and and also to keep the momentum it's it's expensive to bring people together and what was saying in places like lao people farmers are far apart so um, it's it's useful to have uh different means to keep in touch and deepen the learning in between the the, the physical meetings sophie this is jam khalid from pakistan i am uh you know that in, uh, in our country, we have uh, hundreds of field schools and different thematic areas like climate change, uh, IPM, and business, agribusiness like this. So it will be good that we have a cross-cutting idea of, uh, for, uh, for training content in these all field schools. So rather we work on uh, organize different and specific uh, field school uh, on, only on uh, fall army work. So I think the platform can do a very great, good, you know, good support to develop very smart uh, learning tool to, to be integrated in all these ongoing uh, activities. That's a very good point. Uh, thanks, Jian yeah, for for raising it. We we are really uh, very eager to have uh, your inputs and collaborations from anyone who wants to share what is being developed in their country. We have a good idea of what's happening and the material being produced and the tools used in some countries, not in all. But um, it's we're always looking out for doing an inventory and sharing best practices. And maybe at some point we can organize more webinars for sharing experiences uh, specifically on field schools so be in touch and we can work out ideas together okay, thank you. getting in other we're getting in comments from other people uh, but in the interest of time what i will do is leave the comments up here for Anne sophie to address directly so that we can move on to the next presentation and then these points can also be raised in the small group discussions when we go to the breakout rooms, if that's okay with you. So if that's okay with you, can you type yes in your chat box so that at least I know that you can hear me? There is a comment from Dr. Yu Bak and there is a question from Wilma. So um, I will leave this point so we can move on to the next presentation. And so we'll please respond directly to them. And we move on to the next presentation. To support the sharing of quality training videos across the global south. Having found a way to merge scientific with farmers knowledge and making use of multiple ICT tools and distribution channels, let us listen to Paul about some inspiring examples of how videos have been integrated in farmer training programs. So Paul, please, you have the screen. Thank you, Dada. Um, so my name is Paul Forman Mele, and I will talk to you about access agriculture and how we contribute um, as an organization to provide scaling tools for anybody working in the field of agroecology. And we do this through videos for farmers. And just to relate to the challenges that we try to address, especially with regard to farmer field schools, and of course, this is relative. If we say only a limited number of farmers can join FFS, if you see the, the global number, it's, it's pretty amazing how many farmers have already benefited. But as Anne-Sophie said, the, the challenge to scale and to also involve entire communities will require some additional approaches. Um, we also know across, and this is uh, youth and women, they have limited access to knowledge. But also what Anne-Sophie said is that agroecological knowledge is more complex. And because of this complexity, this is actually putting an extra challenge on peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So if farmers have the opportunity to learn in an intensive farmer field school, it may be, um, it may be challenging for them to actually share that knowledge that they learned during the farmer field school with peers who may not have joined the farmer field school. 
We also heard that it is important to provide digital tools. And as one of the participants mentioned, um, you have um, virtual FFS is one of the things that, that is coming up, um, but also farmer trainers. And we will, I think, continue on that during the, the breakout sessions. Uh, during COVID, it is also important to look at what digital tools and how master trainers and pharma field school trainers can actually help in building digital tools in the communities they work with. So, our focus is on, on quality videos and quality videos, they are simple, they are researched. And by researched, I mean, it is combining scientific knowledge with farmers knowledge and they look simple but actually a lot of research has gone into the development of a single video um, to the extent that they are highly motivational all the videos on our platform they are built on discovery learning principles as with farmer field schools and they they are not instructional videos telling farms what to do, but they very much stimulate a better understanding of ecological knowledge and of how certain practices work so that farmers, even if they have a different, and all farmers operate in a different context, even in the same village, the, the resources may be different, whatnot, and the, the farming system differs. So it is important that all these videos also, they trigger farmers to experiment. It's, it's not adoption, it's adaptation that matters and behavioral change. What we also found is because if you focus on quality videos, it is attractive to youth. And youth also can see, wow, somebody has put a lot of attention on making these videos and making them available and making them available in my local language. So for youth, it's also very much a psychological effect to see quality videos and to see a rich library of quality videos. So agriculture all of a sudden becomes something modern. Yes, it's not just the grandparents that do farming. They say, wow, this is something I can do and I can make a business from it. And I have a good understanding as well. So it is, it is creating a lot of uh, attention also from, from youth because they, if it's quality, farmers also want to watch them over and over again. And for us, this was a basis that say, look, if you have a product that people want to see over and over again, there is a business opportunity in it. And I will, I will talk about this in a minute because this relates to establishing also e-extension service providers in rural communities. And as our uh, vision is to change the food systems to more sustainable system, we are trying to influence through our videos and our different ICT tools. We are also trying to influence society at large and there also because videos if they are quality tv stations are eager to broadcast them and so you can actually with farmer training videos if they are well made you can also reach out to the consumers so we have become a global content leader we have more than 220 quality farmer to farmer training videos in more than 80 languages. Unique ICT technologies. We have two different video platforms, a smart projector and the app. I will show that to you in a minute. And we are a small organization. I need to, tell, I need to say this. We are only 25 people and we don't manage any project on the ground. Yeah, we are very much a value adding organization. So providing services to any, anybody working on the ground. And just, just to emphasize how much we are 
adding value and being a scaling organization. On the video platform, we know that more than 500,000 people have made use of the, the video platform and more than 3,000 organizations, mainly in the South, um, using the videos, downloading the videos and screening them, sharing them with farmers. What I mentioned also, the TV stations, and I think this, this is data from 2018, so um, 44 TV stations across the, across the South were actually making, downloading videos and broadcasting them on their TV stations. So it shows that um, videos made also within farmer field schools or based on farmer field schools principles, if they are well crafted and well researched, they can actually also be taken up in mass media. And for those who haven't seen the platform yet, so this is our video platform. And on the, on the top right, you can see that the interface of the platform is in Bangla, English, French, Hindi, and Spanish. Um, we are working on Arabic and looking also into the possibility for Portuguese. Now, anybody can look for suitable videos. So as we mentioned, pharma field schools, even if it is for army worm pharma field schools, farmers are interested in many different topics. Um, so you can see on many different topics, including mechanization, ITN, livestock, business skills, but also approaches. Under approaches, you will see uh, videos on, for, for instance, participatory variety selection. How do you do that? Or um, how do you do in a farmer field school a cost benefit uh, analysis or what they call a participatory farm budgeting. On, on all these topics, there are training videos available. And so you can search them. And once you have found a video of interest underneath each video, you can see that you can actually download the video. If you work for a radio station, you can download the audio. There's also a one page fact sheet with contact information that uh, indicates who and which organization was involved in the production of that particular video, the subject matter specialist with an email address and a mobile number. But immediately underneath, you see the reference books. And I think this is interesting. Um, so we have the possibility here, we have added one of the um, the Pharma Field School training manuals that Anne-Sophie showed in one of her last slides. <clears throat> what I think will be of interest um, to all of you, if you scroll down further, you can see this particular video has been translated into these different languages. <clears throat> If you click on any of those language buttons, the video will open in that language and you can download the video in that language. What we can also do is for each language version, let's say um, you open the Hindi version. If people in India have developed their own reference or um, leaflets or a training manual in Hindi, we can attach that PDF to the particular language version of the video. And so as, as such, also enabling anybody who works in that language uh, area to make use of the training materials. Now, videos are used by, you can see different groups. We were surprised that since 2012, 18 actually farmers have become the major professional group of people downloading content. So this meant or this means that farms are starting to find 
figure content that is of interest to them by themselves. So they don't necessarily need the intermediate intermediators. Um, this actually, when, when we discovered that farmers were actually finding the platform often through Google or through face-to-face -face or through social media, we redesigned and we made it mobile enabled. So it's, it's a, a, re a redesign of the video platform. But within the next two months, we hope also to launch our mobile application. And the mobile application, I think also for the pharma field schools will be extremely interesting because this will faci facilitate learning after pharma field schools but also to enable uh, pharma field school graduates to share videos with other people in their community. Uh, basically, they will be able to see the entire um, video library with all the different topics. It surfaces that one person has downloaded a video on her or his mobile, and then he or she can then share within the app with other colleagues without use of data consumption. So this is, this is gonna be an interesting um, part. I'm just gonna share with you an experience from pharma research because this resonated a lot with what people in Laos were doing, uh, using or embedding smartphone in action research, so obviously with pharma field schools, it will be very interesting and uh, here, the McKnight Foundation in their pharma research network in East Africa, they were actually um, adding 100, more than 100 uh, of our videos in Kiswahili. They preloaded them and they also learned uh, people to take video clips on their smartphone and to use social media. And then they were finding out afterwards how, how useful did you find the smartphones to support your pharma research on soil health? And the results, they were, they were pretty staggering. I mean, I was really surprised. Um, the all, like 80%, they said, well, videos, they were such a source of inspiration. And all the videos were made in different countries. And I think that's also something um, I haven't mentioned yet, the power of South-South learning. Yeah, so we try uh, to encourage farms to learn from their peers and they really did appreciate it. If those farmers can do it, so can we. So this is, I think, a very strong um, indication of empowerment also. And then, Farmers also like to use the phones in, um, in sharing their research with others. Eh? But I'll just move on a bit because of time. Um, next month, we, for the moment, we have a second platform that is called ActQ. We will launch a, a, a new platform which is called EcoActQ, where anybody, this is more like a social media alternative to YouTube, focusing on agriculture. Uh, we will have the opportunity, the, the opportunity to have projects. So here also for FAO, uh, we can actually have projects for, for any FFS program and managers within the FFS program can be managing this platform to allow people to, to upload videos that they made during their pharma field school sessions as a way to share experiences between members in the pharma field school, but also between pharma field schools across the country and even beyond. We have had some fantastic experiences on this in, uh, in Bangladesh. Another thing that I, I believe um, is, is very interesting for pharma field schools is the smart projector. It is, a, it is a computer and a projector built in one, which has an inbuilt application that enables people to access our video platform without being connected to the internet. 
Uh, the suitcase comes with foldable solar panel, um, the sound system. So people can actually screen farmer to farmer videos for an entire day without being connected to the internet and without having electricity. I mentioned that the quality triggers repeat viewing or, or um, that farmers want to watch videos over and over again. They also want their own copies. So with the smart projector, we have now set up a system, an initiative, which we call our Entrepreneurs for Rural Access. And I think this is also something um, young people can actually apply uh, to become an entrepreneur for rural access. And we then equip them and we train them and we coach them over an 18 month period to become private e extension service providers. Now, with the pharma field schools, they could be very well placed, these young people in in the countries where FFS is functional, the pharma field school groups or programs would buy the services of these people. These people, they don't pay anything back to access agriculture. So once they are, um, once they are installed and coached, what they earn from providing their services is entirely theirs. So let me just conclude. And I think what, the Pharma field School and FAO could do is, is to help spread the platform. And I, I know this has been going on for, for quite a while. When the app is released, I'm sure also it will be of great interest to share it with all the Pharma field School programs. Also think of building in how to use the mobile app to build that into the Pharma field School program because building digital skills will be important uh, along with building other soft skills that you already do investing in local language translations and one of the suggestions i have is well we have we have quite a number of videos but i've over the past week during the sessions it, you have given me a lot of ideas and the need to build ecological literacy among farmers is really crucial and i have identified about 10 different videos on different crops that each indicate different aspects on predators, on parasitoids, on, on uh, beneficial fungi, on biodiversity. Um, and I think it would be really useful if the Pharma Field School, including the full army worm program, uh, the pilot project, if you could invest in local language translations, so you have a base um, of, of videos that you can quickly uh, use within your um, program. Of course, the smart projectors, uh, young entrepreneurs, and once it is released, um, feel free also to make use of EcoActive as the social platform to share FFS experiences. So by this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Dada, over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for the very interesting presentation on ICTs. I found it very interesting that you mentioned about using ICTs and videos in particular, not for adoption, but for experimentation. I think that's very important. Yes, well, there are if you if you go if you go so the link i provided is uh, you can find info on the uh, on the projector uh, regarding pests there are there are many videos on many different pests uh, from fruit flies um, yeah H have a look at the ipm category i think there's more than 40 videos on integrated pest management right Great. Yes. So we just have to go to the link that you provided, and I'm sure people will see a lot of other videos there. I will also go back to your present, some of your slides later on um, when we go to the session on training materials. So with that, thank you so much, Paul.
You will also hear more from Paul later on because he will also be co-moderating, co he will be co-moderator in one of the group, uh, um, small groups during the breakout session. Right, moving on. Are we ready to move on? Can you show me a yes in your chat box if you are ready to move to the next session? Give me a yes in your chat box. Yes. Right. Thanks, Warren. Yes, Jihad. Thank you. Now, the next session, you'll have to pay very close attention to the instructions so you don't get lost. We will be moving into our breakout groups. And here are the instructions for your breakout group discussions. I will be flashing questions on the screen of the questions for the breakout groups. I advise you to take photographs of all the questions for discussions because you will be assigned to groups randomly. You don't know which group you will be assigned to, so make sure to take photographs of all the questions for discussions. Second point, the host will prompt you to join the breakout room, and when you see the prompt asking you to join the breakout room, please join. Uh, click join so that you can be sent to your breakout room. When you get to your breakout room, please unmute your microphones and share. This is the time when you can share, when you can talk. We're not asking you to mute your phone. Unmute your mics when you get to your breakout rooms, but please don't talk at the same time. Okay, fourth, after 15 minutes, you will automatically be moved back to the plenary for the report out. The host will advise you two minutes before the end of the session um, to get out of the breakout room, but you can continue discussing until you reach 15 minutes after which you will automatically be sent back to the main room for the plenary. Okay. We will do another round of these instructions after I give you the questions for your breakout groups. Okay, now please take a picture of all the questions because you don't know to which group you will be sent. Breakout group number one is the same group, it's the same question that you have to answer. Question number one for group number one for breakout group number one. What are training target beneficiaries and communities or stakeholders in rural areas for which effective fowl management strategies and training programs need to be designed? What kind of training does each target beneficiary or community need? What training content and intensity is needed for a not yet infested area? What for a newly infested or low population area? Mm heavily infested area with foul establishment, immediate and long-term responses. Your co-moderator will be Marion Fredericks and your spokesperson will be Wilma. I hope you have taken a picture of that question for group one. Group number two, your question is question number two and your breakout room is breakout room number two. Okay, what activities on FAO FFS extension, communication are planned or ongoing in your countries? What works? What does not work? What additional training resources are needed beyond what you have available already? How does COVID-19 affect hands-on face-to-face training? And how does this influence your training strategy or strategies? What kind of training activities are possible in the current context of COVID-19, what additional skills are needed to be a good online facilitator. Your co-moderator is Paul Van Mele and your spokesperson is Anne-Sophie Poisseau. Group number three, breakout group number, breakout room number three and question number three, where there is existing capacity for farmer training, 
what additional training is needed to prepare facilitators and trainers for effective training interventions on FAO management, long or short? What would be the contents, process, and duration of long training programs? What would they be? Short training programs? What skills and knowledge would facilitators need to assess better what to include in farmer training for it to be more targeted to different scenarios of fall infestation and establishment? Your co-moderator is Chris Wickus and your spokesperson is Cham Khalid. There's a bit of an error there, just please correct that. The co-moderator is Chris Wickus and your spokesperson is Cham Khalid. Apologies for that error. Group number four. How can you mobilize the network of FFS facilitators and master trainers in your countries to support your FAO programs, national region or regional experts, the global FFS platform? What mechanisms do you have in place to exchange and share within the Asian FFS IPM network in the current context? Considering that you will have to carry out various tasks relative to FAO management, how can you ensure quality of your FAO training programs? Your co-moderator is Jan Willem, and your spokesperson is Vorn Talom Chantabong. We go back to the instructions to make sure everybody gets that. I hope you have taken photographs of all the questions for discussions. When the host prompts you to join, please click join so that you can be sent to your breakout room. And in the breakout room, unmute your microphones and share. You will be alerted some seconds back, uh, some seconds before the time is up. Otherwise, after 15 minutes, you will automatically be moved back to the plenary for the report out. So if Jenny is ready, Jenny, I think we're ready to be sent to the breakout rooms. Are we all back in the main room? Can you give me a yes in your chat box? While we're waiting for the other people, let's do some picture puzzles. Yeah. Now, so can you type in your chat box which two things are wrong in the picture? said the date is 31 June. It's not 31 June, it's 6 November. What's yeah. the thing that's wrong in the picture? Yes, one more I need to find out. Well, the other thing there is June has only 30 days. It's yes. not days, I think. Uh, the PC, no, PC is not in a good position where you can adjust that. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, coffee is getting cold. Mm, I'm not too sure about that. Guess again. What's the other thing that's wrong in the picture? Look at the keyboard. No alphabets. No numbers. There are numbers. Guess again. Okay, one second to guess. Key keyboard? Yes, there's something wrong with the keyboard. Yeah, it's true, it's blank, but okay, here is the answer. There is no... Yeah, arrow marks. There's no space bar. Okay, now, okay. second one. Look at this. The water glasses are filled. Which glass contains the most water? C. Can you say why? The weight is less compared to others. Can you type why? Why do you say C? Why do you say C of one? Ah. Very small object. Right. Right. Okay, next one. How many girls are there in the picture? Two. 
Okay, Ugyan says two, Jam says four. Any other answer? Jam Mustafa says eight, but this says a third. Four. Four. Says six. Six, six. Four, four. Six, four. You want to know the right answer? It's two. Exactly. It's two. Yeah. It's a mirror. There are two girls. Right. Thank you. Thank you for participating in the group number one. Can you please take the virtual stage? So hello, everybody. Hello. Okay. So in the Philippines, it's good afternoon. So I will be reporting the result of the discussion in group number one. So the questions are, who are the training target uh, groups? Then number two is, what kind of training are we going to, he to have for those not yet infested areas, for those newly infested areas, for heavy infested, and also uh, how are we going to respond? Okay, so for the first question, we have the target groups to be trained are farmers. They need to have the awareness and basic ideas. Then also the extension workers, because they are the one in the field with the farmers. Uh, the support staff, because they will be the one to help in the planning and uh, in the management of the fall army worm. So we have also the local government technicians. We have also the group of crops technicians because fall armyworm is polyphagous. We have also the staff in the regions. Then the one in charge of the trainings in the training institute. And also we need to train also the cooperative technicians or members of the cooperatives of the farmers, as well as some member of the academies for the assessment, especially in the field. They can help in the assessment of fall damage in the field. So those are the target groups. Then on how, on what kind of training we are going to give for uh, those not yet infested, they need to be aware of the pests, so they have to, to, they have to know how to identify it, so especially the morphology and the ecology. And they must know also how to monitor or detect it, to survey, because they must know where to look first in the field. Then for the newly infested area where there is low population, we need, them, we need to train them on the ecology and the morphology of the pest as well as the biology and also the management. So in this, uh, in this uh, training, we have to advance already their knowledge on resistance because they must be using, they, will, they might be using insecticides. So they must know something on resistance management. Then for heavily infested farmers, uh, heavily infested fields, uh, year insect resistance management training is very important, but we need to train them also on biology, on management, like how to apply insecticide in the world and other cultural practices. Then, there is a question of the immediate response. So to immediately respond to a fall army worm is to go to the local technicians or the local government. And the first response is what are the resources available in that area? And we will have some uh, like biological control enhancement or natural enemies enhancement, I think is necessary in that area because it's the first available in, that, in the field. 
And for the longer term, uh, we need the IPM or biological control or enhancement of natural uh, enemies is needed. So I think those are the, the things we had in the discussion. Uh, they, and also there is an additional year that whenever there is a new infestation and there is a high population, we need to do some technical de demo demonstration so that the partners, so that the farmers will know how to manage the pest. Great. Okay. Okay. That's all. Okay. Thank you, group one. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, Wilma. Great answers. Of course, the responses will be recorded and will be part of the report of this webinar. Let's move on to group two. Group two, please. Uh, Paul, you have the virtual stage. Okay, thank you, Bella. In, in our group, we talked uh, briefly about what activities are being undertaken on, on for army and farm field school, and mainly also how the COVID-19 situation affected the activities. Um, few people responded, time was a little short, but we could see a wide diversity of, of topics being addressed. Uh, Sekar from India was saying that initially there was a focus on pesticides, but now they have completely shifted to testing um, metarhizium, bovaria. So bio, a lot of focus on uh, biopesticides, which are being tested in collaboration with the private sector. Um, also interesting experiments going on, very promising on intercrops and trap crops, on pheromone lures, and that they have also worked on establishing or spreading the slow releasing defense for monitoring the pole army worm. Um, working in collaboration with, with many different institutes, including with, with international institutes like CIMIT and ICRISAT, but also bringing in local experts from the different regions. Now, one of the interesting communication strategies that um, appeared from as a response to COVID, I think, or maybe before that, is that there are many different WhatsApp groups being established um, with yeah, different people discussing different, different themes. Um, this was also reiterated. I mean, the, the social media is important. Sharon from Karnataka, he mentioned also the importance of local language and as a response to COVID, they have organized a webinar for farmers where they were actually showing real life samples of the four army worm and the different stages of the four army worm. And that proved to be very effective to communicate um, how to identify the four army worm in farmers fields. Also, leaflets have been established in the local languages and distributed through, through many different means, including through the KVK system. And Alex also mentioned, although he did not work with World Health Organization on for army worm, but on their, their programs on health-related um, vectors, is, is to identify key community people who can actually um, help as, as key trainer for farm to farmer extension. So that was also, I think, a response to COVID that uh, increasingly looking at, okay, which trainers can be identified in the community to work, so to avoid the spread of people. Hey, to yeah. Thank you. I think this is this is what I captured from from our discussion in, in group two. Thanks a lot. Great, Paul. Thanks. Thank you for that. Very interesting indeed. 
and especially uh, what has been done uh, in times of uh, COVID-19. Can we have the spokesperson from group three to present the outputs of the group, please? Okay. Uh, regarding the first question, which was about uh, the existing capacity of, uh, for, you know, uh, the additional training needed for, uh, so the answer was to uh, some questions, you know, very brief answers we get from our participants. We had a good discussion. So now the answer is that the knowledge and the information sharing at country level, like many countries, they don't have it, uh, you know, still they, uh, they are not even able to say that they have far. Like even Pakistan, they are just in confusion. And information, uh, institutional capacity development, uh, development that is required. Uh, information of uh, far, including biological aspect that mm -hmm. is uh, shared by our friend uh, that that's required and uh, village level uh, crash training program in term of short training that is required and integrated integrate far management as a cross cutting in all ongoing field school or any other long duration training programs uh, that is also required uh, uh, suggested so what would be the content especially and process and duration so we have segregated into this like uh, a type of ICT, ICT tools uh, being used for farm management, that, that's a content uh, level. Use of ICT tool for facilitators, video and digital support, reaching farmer process uh, is required. Uh, methodologies to reach out the farmers and for resilient practices like we are doing climate resilient practices so need to identify like for, for as well. And processes that uh, early warning, early action that is also amended in the FAO that also can be, uh, this uh, FAO can also be the part of this at uh, regional and national and local levels. Uh, pest warning, that's also the uh, process which is many countries they have early for pest warning system and farm free school processes almost there in more than 100 countries. Mass media campaigns and awareness, agroecological preventive measures, uh, resistant and resilient varieties uh, demonstration of uh, our best practices like TNV practice also uh, is extension system uh, community actions collective actions and farmers to farmer learning that the process uh, here uh, duration that could be different because this is a huge content like uh, it could be one few few days to six months and even a year round uh, depends on uh, regarding the third question, that is about the knowledge and skills required by facilitator. So for identification, it's monitoring and it's reporting mechanism that, that is required. Uh, Non-formal education skills for adult learning where uh, like they work with the farmers, farmer, farmers to farmer training or farm office school. And especially the science by farmer skills, like the basic science that is required by uh, the farmers to by themselves to identify and uh, the best solutions of this of this past. So these are the points we, we summarize and we incorporated from our group, group three. Thank you, Dada. Great, thank you, group three. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, John. Very interesting answers. Um, now let's have uh, group four. Spokesperson, Warren, can you please take the virtual stage? I'm going to report um, for the group four, due to, to the time limited and then uh, limited um, uh, comments and ideas that um, I could get in within the assigned time. So then the, uh, my report would be very much in the Lao context because I got all the inputs from my colleagues, for uh, Lao colleagues for, for group four. The, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Um, the question is, <clears throat> how can you mobilize the network of FFS facilitators and master trainers in your countries to support your four program. Uh, then uh, what uh, the answer for this question in Lao context is that we we would uh, we we worked and we can mobilize the trainers or existing network 
by working with the government um, and coordinating with government to, to get our trainer to, to support the program. Uh, when we need, um, you know, uh, for the resource uh, uh, for, from other sources like uh, nation, um, regional experts or we, we would reach them through the um, uh, informally. That's what we, we, we have been doing, who we know. Yeah, and then um, for the, and we also use the, um, the global platform as a source of an um, exchange and uh, to keep updates on the um, development. Uh, for that, that's it. That's for question number one. We can do it through the government. For question number two, what, what mechanism do you have in place to exchange and share within the ASEAN IPM FFS network in the current situation? Uh, we, we just simply do it through the, um, through the Top of the screen, 4605173. So on your phone, enter menti.com uh, and, and get into this uh, uh, survey that we have here. So the question is, what is the overall goal of national follow me one training plans? Why do we do these training plans? So can you start typing in your response in your phone app? Uh, enter a, a couple of words. So it could be two or three words maximum, uh, what is the goal of national full army one training plans? It could be farmer education, it could be better extension services, it could be IPM. So you could start typing into the mentee on your phone to get some answers, share your answers. And then you click submit. Okay, we're starting to see responses coming up. That's great. Agroecology, prevent pesticide abuse, innovation, farmer empowerment, IPM, knowledge sharing, better IPM capacities, IPM, IPM is coming strongly. Agroecology, monitoring knowledge, education, innovation. Okay, nice. I can see some responses are still coming. All right, wonderful. So, um, okay, IPM innovation, maximum outreach, early warning training, knowledge, from empowerment. So we have a lot of the, a lot of the topics and the responses are about IPM, sound IPM, innovations, eco-friendly management, agroecology, etc., bio-intensive approach, etc. And a lot of the other responses are around education, training, capacities, uh, knowledge sharing, reach, etc., etc. So we can move on. Um, and go back to our uh, to our slides. Um, okay, I will go back to the slides. All right. So um, so the overall goal of our training um, of our training um, development plans, in fact, can be summarized uh, as as this: ensure that farmers take well informed decisions on following worm that are based on sound IPM approaches. What we mean by that is agroecosystem-based IPM. We know that IPM is sometimes used as a catchword to just do scouting and then pesticide sprays. What we mean here is a preventative approaches to IPM and biological control uh, and uh, an agroecosystem-based uh, IPM approaches. And the 
ultimate goal is to minimize negative impacts on the, of the pest on farmers livelihoods firsthand on the environment and on future sustainability of their farming systems also. And of course, our full armium training plan also you, uh, aims at the second category of responses that everybody uh, typed in, which was on the process of working, the types of approaches, the methodologies, etc. So the plan is about defining the process of working of us, all of our stakeholders, a range of different stakeholders in support of this um, uh, objective of farmer decision making. So ensuring sound IPM and biocontrol strategies is one of the core goals that we've heard about again and again. So consider the IPM pyramid that we discussed when designing IPM strategies and content. Do, so do you remember this pyramid um, that um, um, was presented by uh, Chris, but also I think maybe Buyung mentioned the pyramid. So what gets to the um, uh, bottom of the pyramid? Can you quickly type in what gets into the yellow? Do you remember? Not able to. So a number of, of things uh, go into the bottom of the pyramid. What gets into the middle of the pyramid and what gets to the top of the pyramid? Okay, so we're starting some, we see some responses in the chat. So use of technology, agroecological techniques go to the bottom of the pyramid, okay? At, um, avoidance at the bottom, Lalit says, avoidance at the bottom, so the preventative approaches um, uh, and uh, the good cultural practices, says Girat. So that goes in the yellow. No? Uh, cultural, agroecological, mechanical control for uh, the, the pest, uh, the Fulam Yuam goes to the bottom in the yellow, the, uh, add sandal. Cultural controls, so crop um, rotations, associations maybe, biological control, says San Sanjay, goes in the bottom. Um, so the, the bottom is larger because we, that should be the bulk of the strategy that is deployed, both at the level of a country and a research system and at the level of the uh, farmer uh, itself and her or herself. The middle uh, is, uh, is, as Jihad recalls, is sampling, uh, monitoring, uh, says Jigdish. Um, the middle is detection. So monitoring systems get into the middle. Uh, uh, and at the top, we get uh, uh, thresholds, pesticides, etc., which should be the last resort for our. Um, for Lamiwam control strategy. So we've sort of reconstructed our pyramid nicely here. So I'll show the full pyramid. So this is what came very clearly and nicely from uh, our, our, um, our um, uh, uh, two sessions, uh, previous sessions um, last week and, and earlier this week. Um, uh, prevention should come first, as well as low tox methods and uh, pesticide uh, and insecticides are um, used as a last resort. So I will invite you to go back to the second question on your mentee. Um, so next question is coming up on your mentee. All right. So what does the IPM pyramid look like in your country? Uh, we had uh, Chris explaining how in a lot of countries, and he showed slides, if you recall, that in a lot of countries is more like a, an obelisk than a pyramid. So what about your country? Is it more like a pyramid? Is it rather upside down pyramid? So pesticides are actually prevailing uh, as, as an approach in government and in, in farmers' fields. And there might be differences in, in these two, of course, governments or research might recommend one approach and farmers are yet not aware. Uh, so it looks like an obelisk or it's a shape that is different and never seen before.
So we're getting more responses coming in. For now, it's mostly upside down, pesticides prevail. But in some countries, it's good to hear that it's more of a uh, pyramid or a shape that never seen before. So maybe signaling there is some, not a lot of coherence in what is happening or not a lot of um, imp uh, adoption or ad uh, by farmers of what are the national strategies, maybe. Okay, we'll give it a, a few more seconds for people who may want to add their, uh, their country uh, IPM shape. Okay, now we'll go back and we can uh, close this. All right, so we'll go back uh, to, uh, the, um, to, the, to our PowerPoint. All right, so, um, so that uh, tells us how important it is to continue um, re, uh, disseminating and making more accessible the approaches at the bottom of the pyramid where we are having issues getting that across to farmers. So um, enhancing and supporting access to biological control is one of the key take home messages. I think that we've recapped in this, uh, in this training, in this three day training, and that can mean conservation of already existing natural enemies and enabling farmers to, to recognize natural enemies. Someone said earlier, they don't even know which ones are the natural enemies. And that's often what, where we start in farmer field schools programs. Um, also, there's a lot of uh, potential natural enemies and entomopathogens that are not yet known and, and over, overview studies have been done in a lot of countries on what are the natural enemies um, for the four army worm, which came as a new pest. Uh, and there's now a lot of accumulated knowledge and production and releases can be, uh, can be quickly ramped up um, and, and um, fall army worm and conservation biological control through uh, plant diversity, et cetera, um, it can be uh, also supported by the classical biological control where necessary, but especially maybe augmentative or inundative uh, biological control uh, when governments are, 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 are geared up. And, and this access from bio, for, to biocontrol can be um, at the same time at, at the um, level of commercial uh, products, making commercial products more available. Uh, we've heard about the fast track registration process for Folagen in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, other countries have also uh, supported the, the, um, um, the, the registration of these new biocontrol agents. India has, has registered a few, for instance, and in the, in the process of registering more. But um, government production and releases is one part of it. Commercial products, especially maybe for biopesticides, is, is, is another one. And the, uh, on the other hand, um, farmers can well produce uh, either natural enemies or uh, pathogens. Uh, farmers can pick up uh, larvae that are dead from fungi, for instance, metrorhizium, or from MPVs, from viruses, crush them, put it in a blender and spray that mix in filter and spray that filter mix in the field. And we've seen that work beautifully in, in context, like we worked on that in India with the government in some states. Um, and, and India has actually a, a good uh, training program um, by, uh, by the National Bureau of Agriculture in Resources and, and the NIPHM uh, Plant Health Management. Uh, to train farmers on local production. And countries like China, Thailand, we've heard a lot about the, these biocontrol strategies and, and many more in the last few days. I think this is something that really needs to get policy attention. Um, so the, the other important issue we discussed is pesticides, pesticide as a last resort. And unfortunately, there's lots of mammalian toxic pesticides and pesticides with chronic health impacts on pregnant women and children that are being used largely in, in for army one uh, control operations by government. Um, so uh, again, pesticides should be used as a last resort. FAO has a nice policy brief on pesticide use in, in, um, in Fort Army Worm, uh, because this is often the first reaction of some governments to purchase pesticide to show farmers that they're doing something and trying to control. Um, 
Paul Jepsen uh, and the technical working group uh, on fall armyworm on insecticide at FAO that gathers a lot of different research institutions, Paul has come up with excellent guidance on um, how to select pesticides that are on the one hand low tox, low risk, and on the other hand effective against the, the fall armyworm because we know the fall armyworm is resistant to, for instance, pyrethroids and, and a number of other insecticides. So uh, we need to use, if pe pesticide will be used as a last resort, we need to avoid highly hazardous pesticides. We need to favor uh, pesticides that are compatible with IPM. We had a bit of a discussion on seed treatments. Uh, Chris was saying they're not IPM compatible. So, um, um, uh, seed treatments um, can vary a lot. Uh, we have to acknowledge that sometimes hybrid seeds come already coated and it's hard to avoid that. Uh, on the other hand, countries like Thailand are doing seed coating with metarizium and, and that could be interested if good data is there to support the efficacy. Um, there's been, there are commercial products now on uh, based on Cialantani Viprol and uh, a com a co in a combination with Tiametoxam, um, that is an, a formulation one a formulation that is being promoted by a, a pesticide company uh, uh, under Fortenza Duo. So there seems to be not a lot of evidence on um, using neonicotinoids for full army one, uh, according to the technical working group on pesticides and Paul Jepson. Uh, there's some skepticism about and lack of data, but if, if data is there, it is worth exploring. Um, uh, neonicotinoids can concern us, but um, there's, of course, a lack of uh, impact pathways on and pet pollinators from maize, which is when pollinated. So uh, there are no simple answers, but we really need to be asking that key questions. Are seed treatments IPM compatible and are they effective and backed by data? So ultimately, we also need to continue training farmers on and pesticide vendors, trainers on risk reduction and risk analysis. So uh, I'll, I'll share again the link to this very interesting study that Paul, um, uh, Kathy and others have been publishing in The Lancet, which is a very, very renowned journal on selecting insecticides to reduce human uh, and environmental health risk. And we can share that as part of the resources from this training. So another very important uh, aspect that we discussed in our last days, again, oh, uh, on the what, what do we do to do the trainings, to, to ensure the trainings are effective, is the stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders, um, uh, farmers are, are too often overlooked as innovators. Um, we tend to see in, uh, innovation as coming from research and plant protection systems or private sector, but farmers can usually innovate. And we've heard a lot of very exciting uh, stories from the countries in these past uh, three sessions. Uh, so um, they should be at the forefront of working with researchers and facilitators uh, to do action research. Um, and, and, and that's a last point we want to make and uh, is find the need to fine tune options for action research um, with uh, farmers, uh, with researchers, local adaptations of what works and what doesn't against the full armyworm in specific contexts, in specific ecologies that might differ from one place to another while continuing learning from what other countries are doing. Um, and farmer field schools can really be a starting point uh, to get researchers involved to working with farmers and with extension workers more closely and to do action research around the field schools uh, afterwards um, uh, with groups that continue to evolve and, and test things even after the field schools has ended. And, um, and in this way, a lot of farmer field schools have become innovation platforms, working more closely with researchers and with, um, with uh, extension technical support, and that all with private companies to, to uh, introducing biological control agents or biopesticides. And, um, and that's uh, something that's, that's quite interesting um, to, uh, to, to continue exploring. So now we've talked a lot about the what should be the training about. Now, how do we reach and empower farmers? That's the, uh, the in terms of the process, in terms of the, the tools. So uh, it's important to 
in defining what are the training methodologies that you will use this training this mix now we talk a lot about blended training not using only one method but a combination of methods so to determine what are the best methods we need to assess the context and, and farmer needs um, we heard a great story from Lao from Andrew Bartlett uh, about maize not really being so important in northern Lao as a food security crop or as a, an economic crop. It was mostly for, for export for um, feed, animal feed. And so farmers were not prepared to spend a lot of time on, uh, on, on, on their maize and therefore not a lot of time on learning. So Andrew was telling us in this context, a heavy intensive method like farmer field schools is probably not of great interest for farmers for that type of farmers, whereas maybe in other places like Salvin Leo, like this photo that you see at the bottom, Sher Bayan, um, farmers who are, for whom maize is an important crop for food security might have a, a much bigger interest in, in investing time in being trained and in learning. So there are many, many questions that we can ask ourselves to suit the learning objectives and the training modalities to the context and the needs of the farmers. And there's a wide range of different tools that can be used, instant messaging, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, action research short courses, peer groups on social media, et cetera. Um, and um, we can um, now, uh, I'd like to invite you to, um, uh, go back to your mentee and open the new uh, poll that is uh, coming up now in mentee. It's about to come up. Okay. All right. I'll share the screen again on this one. All right, I hope you can see the screen. So the key question, the question here is, what do you think are the key questions to ask in order to better assess the needs of different farmers, different farmer groups, and select the best training modalities to reach these farmers? So here, please um, type in the code that's at the top of the screen, 8121331. So meanwhile, while you're um, uh, registering, you can think about this question, or if you're not on Menti, you can also type in your answer in the Q&A, um, in the Q&A box. Um, what are the key questions to ask ourselves in order to assess the actual needs of different groups of farmers? Um, and um, how do we therefore on that basis select the training modalities that are most appropriate? We're starting to see some responses. Okay, what is the level of infestation? The level of infestation is in fact going to largely determine how much farmers want to invest time. If there is no farm army worm anywhere, they're unlikely to want to attend farmer field schools on full army worm or they'll focus on full army worm. Can far do farmers recognize full army worm? Identification through insect zoo is the suggestion. So the insect zoos that I showed in the farmer field school. How old are farmers and what access they have to digital technologies? I think Wilma was saying the other day that farmers they are working with in the Philippines are fairly aging and they don't have a lot of access or ease with digital um, means. So that's not very easy for them to deploy uh, or very relevant to deploy ICTs to train farmers. So somebody else said, gauge farmers' basic agroecological knowledge. What are key natural enemies? How to recognize full army worm? Understanding of key ecological concepts. So yeah, so the, the farmers' knowledge will be important to assess 
to understand um, what um, um, kind of training methods you want to deploy. What problems are faced in May, said someone else. Why follow me where needs to be controlled or managed? What are the good methods to train farmers in local level? Uh, yes, indeed, uh, uh, farmers will invest if it's, if it's a, uh, yeah, a, a real problem for them. Good sponsor is needed based on area coverage of maize, sorghum covered ICT tool, knowledge on pe basic pest identification and natural enemies. Okay, so let's take it one more minute to um, provide more inputs. If anybody else wants to share thoughts, what are the key questions to ask ourselves to assess the training, the needs of farmers and the training modalities? Thirty more seconds. Okay. Before we close, oh, one more. How many farmers do I want to reach? Yes. Okay. So numbers of farmers to be reached uh, will determine also the training modalities. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, indeed it's important that any of our training programs uh, carefully assesses what are the um, um, uh, training approaches that are best suited to an objective. So as we say, form follows function, therefore the type of training modality uh, is depending on our, uh, our, uh, our targets. So here, this is a photo from uh, Andhra Pradesh, where we are filming a former field school. So we're using a participatory video making um, in the yellow and white and black check shirt is a farmer, is a farmer leader who has been trained as a community video producer by Digital Green. And on the left is an FFS facilitator and he's demonstrating pouring a soil mix in and water in the world of maize uh, and these plants were um, infected by fall army well and it's is taking place on the, in the context of that fall farmer field schools that you see on the right so this uh, video was made it was produced uh, filming other activities in the field school and was then um, put online so you can also of course blend the methods and 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 use uh, um, uh, farmer um, education uh, ICT approaches in your physical trainings. So um, um, another point that we discussed is simple messages. Sometimes simple messages are most suited, but it doesn't mean that this is a top-down approach necessarily or a research a researcher defining all the messages. We can also define and formulate effective messages with farmers through action research processes. So they are in, in languages that farmers can understand. They reflect their concerns. They are in local language. Um, and as we can set up peer groups using social media. Um, we've seen a lot of examples of that with WhatsApp and others, uh, ensuring support by technicians. So uh, you, there, need, there can be various interactive ways of using social media. It doesn't have to be only a, a one directional. And uh, clearly uh, new challenges and new tools like digitalization of extension means uh, that we need new skills, new skills on digital facilitation, on digital learning for the facilitators and, and for the farmers. So I think probably use of ICTs may need to become an, an important uh, stand up, standing session in all of our training courses, whether it's on farmer field school training of facilitators, whether it's extension workers, in um, developing uh, training uh, guidance to our field staff on using ICTs is becoming more and more important. Considering the COVID cont context, um, of course, has only heightened this issue of digitalization and the need for distance training. And all of our trainings of facilitators need to be weaving in these concerns also. And, uh, and how do we, um, when we can have group sessions, how do we make sure these are safe? And what precaution measures do we need to adjust? If we do icebreakers in pharma field schools, they should be no touch icebreakers, uh, where we don't have physical contacts, which we do all the time in, in a lot of these icebreakers and, 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 uh, and team building exercises. Um, so we need a 
rethink what activities we can propose in the COVID context as part of any extension training to make sure that these trainings become a source of knowledge and, and information in communities and not a source of contamination. Um, building TP taps in your group, uh, farmer field school, um, making uh, soap has been done in a lot of countries uh, that we worked on in Africa, for instance, making soap in the field schools, even sometimes as an income generating activities in communities. So in FFS, the curricula will be fine-tuned to specific context. Uh, and, and again, we can use uh, them for community mobilization uh, in or outside FFS with an active monitoring role of communities. We've heard uh, good presentations on famous, but also just one right now from Vietnam um, on, on how do we use um, uh, um, uh, community work for um, monitoring, in this case, actually for trapping as well as monitoring in Vietnam. So networking remains critical. We said that several times this morning, we had a group work on this, um, building farmer peer groups, informal uh, exchange, um, uh, uh, social media platforms, and also utilizing national FFS networks that have been creating through the years, and how can we mobilize them on the full army web. So um, creating an enabling environment for training, uh, advocacy at policy level is important. Um, when we build our IPM, uh, for, uh, for our IPM training plans, it's important to ensure uh, uh, that we do advocacy to continue um, convincing our policymakers that investing in farmers, investing in ecosystems is critical. Uh, and, and that we need longer term sustainable responses more than just short term responses. Um, regulatory frameworks for biocontrol and biopesticides. We've heard good examples on fast tracking for Bangladesh for uh, registration. And it's important because it will help um, make, these, make products accessible to farmers. Finally, policy support and interest for action research and participatory innovation uh, with farmers is uh, continuously needed. Uh, there's also often a lot of misunderstanding about the role of farmers uh, that cannot innovate. Uh, and in fact, we can see from a lot of our field work and what we've heard in these past three days that there's a lot of innovations coming uh, that and adaptations coming from farmers. So we need to continue generating support um, and interest from researchers and, and, from, uh, and from policymakers. So that's a bit of a recap of what we, we discussed in the last few days. Um, I'd like to invite you to type in any more points you think should be uh, reflected uh, in, our, um, uh, in our recap uh, and any questions that you might have before we go into our closing session. So anything, anything we missed and what is your take home message from this training? If you wanna share that in the chat. Um, what is your take home message? I see comments that Chris uh, recall that chamitoxan is a neonicotinoid. Indeed, it is a neonicotinoid, um, which is banned by the EU, yes. Although maize not being a pollinated crop, uh, I mean, open pollinated, wind pollinated, it, the impact pathways for uptake is probably not the major concern for, for maize, but indeed uh, neonicotinoids are banned in the EU. So Yam says points have been well described. Okay, good. Paul uh, says we need further support South South learning. That's very right. Such as by translating available videos, farmer to farmer videos into more local languages and also making use of social media video platform like AgTube. Um, and in fact, um, 
we don't necessarily need to always recreate new videos, but we can translate what has been done in other countries at a very, very low cost, only a few hundred dollars. Follow me when a serious challenge, says Diam from Pakistan. We have to be alert and ready to treat and keep it to limits. So managing levels of infestation is critical. And in fact, the earlier we observe and monitor and, 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 and the more we have prevented through plant diversity, early planting and good soil health and good plant health management, the, the lower infestation levels will be. We have so much data on this. Sharing IPM models among the partners, says Shekhar in a, in a direct message. Maybe that was not posted to the entire group. Paul adds, consider rural youth to help build digital literacy. That's a very good suggestion, I think. The youth uh, can play a good role in their communities on this. Sharam reminds us of the importance of intercropping, promoting IPM practices. It can be a challenge in this pandemic time. Safety come first. Discover and describe local natural enemy communities. This is, are, are very important. Lots of local bugs are already attacking Folomiwam, and there's lots of room for applied science and discovery-based learning together as core components of FFS, says Chris. And Jack did re recall the, the priorities to train farmers on stepwise insecticide or biopesticide application, while we still want to keep it ideally at the top of our pyramid, um, using digital learning system in current COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much. I think we are now moving to the closing session of our, um, uh, our, our three days. I'm sure there's lots to say. I will pass back the floor back to Marut. It's been wonderful being with you and I look forward to the next steps of working together. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Marie, hey, Anna Sophia, uh, for a great presentation and a lot of stuff that we can learn from your session. Uh, I would like to turn this uh, floor to Mr. Yu Bak for a closing remarks before I uh, close the uh, the meeting room today. Mr. Yubak, are you here? Thank you, Marut. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Distinguished participants, dear presenters and moderators, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Swardik Hap and Namaste from Bangkok. It gives me a great pleasure to express closing remarks in this three days webinar series and regional training workshop for pharmaceutical school facilitators and sustainable management of fall hormium IPM Biocontrol and Farmers Field School, which was jointly organized by FAO and Thai Education Foundation. As we all are aware that the fall armyworm is a transboundary insect pest that has merged many parts of the world by this time and ever since of its outbreak from its native place in Africa in 2016. Various attempts are in place to limit its spread and losses However, it has been gaining economic pest status by threatening food security. With its unique attributes, it invaded, it invaded Asia in July 2018, probably the first time in India and Bangladesh and a couple of other countries on this year, on that year. As of October 2019, the presence of fall hormium has been confirmed in most part of the Asian countries, including China, Indonesia, India, Japan, Laos, PD, Lao PDR, Malaysia, Myanmar, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Cambodia, and the Philippines. It is pity to mention that in early 2020, fall hormium has confirmed its presence in Australia and Pacific country, Timor-Leste, and Papua New Guinea also. Interestingly, it has not been reported yet in Bhutan, and a very negligible presence as shown in Republic of Korea. The damage caused by this paste is associated in terms of both quantity and quality. In Asia and Pacific region, the losses caused by the fall hormone vary from negligible Republic of Korea and somehow low, high to 40% in Nepal, Philippines, Thailand, and some other countries to a significantly higher damages 
nearly 40% in Vietnam and Cambodia as reported by the country sources. And this loss depending on the season and the crop. As a robust response, FAO has developed global action on fall armium control, which was launched by the Director General of the FAO in December 2019. The major objective of this global action of fall, over, fall armium was to scale up various science-based solutions with key partners and member countries. Considering its impact on food security and nutrition security, FAO Regional Office has also been rolling out fall armium activities in the region through TCPs, through regional TCPs, as well as country-specific TCPs. As a result, one of the activity, if we, if we recall that International Conference on Fall Armium took place in Bangkok, Thailand in March 2019. Scientists from relevant institutions and participants practitioners took part and share their views, knowledges, experiences in curbing the spread of this pest in the region. In early August 2020, ASEAN approved a fall armium action plan, which spells out priority actions for fall armium management to be implemented in the ASEAN region. As the FAR continues to spread, FAO is poised to help member countries through various programs. And this three days webinar session is also one of the reflection of these initiatives. Throughout the program, throughout the three days program, the experts presented to, on the very pertinent topics, areas, and issues. Similarly, the sessions were wonderfully moderated. All the sessions focused on IPM, biological control, and capacity building, focusing on Farrell's Field School. Participation, participation remained wider not only from South and South East, Southeast Asia region, but we could see from other region, mostly from the government agencies, which is very good to know that. And I'm very much glad to note that the outcomes set out in this webinars are well met with a better understanding among the participants, application of IPM through enhanced biocontrol measures for the sustainable management of all armium. The presentations on the Global Action Plan, MAUs, and the Asian Action, Asian Action Plan for Fall Armium, they facilitate a better understanding of plans and priorities for Fall Armium Action in the region. The panel discussion helped enlighten some of the Fall Armium, IPM prevention, and management implementation challenges faced in the number of the countries. It is equally important to note that the difficulty in this moment that we are facing in the moment created by the coronavirus pandemic has a grave impact on the agriculture sector. Access to agriculture inputs, reliable infrastructures, extension services, and training is no longer guaranteed. Monitoring and management of all hormones are consequently difficult in these times. However, we have to take measures to ensure food security at national and the international levels by mitigating the risk. On behalf of FAO and the Asia Pacific Plant Protection Commission, in particular, its Standing Committee on Integrated Pest Management and co-organizer, I am highly thankful to the presenters, moderators, and participants for making this event a very successful and a productive a very good, we have a very good take of messages to all of us. I sincerely thank High Education Foundation colleagues, especially Marut, Ian, and other colleagues for shouldering this work. The insightful presentation made by China, made by the colleagues from China, India, Philippines, Thailand, Laos, Bangladesh, and digital technology by Paul reflected the fall armium works in the region. Similarly, the presentation made by our expert, Dr. Chris, Buyung, Jean, Allison, and various aspects of the fall armium 
and its possible management. They remain very, very wonderful, very eye opening, very insightful and very interactive. The wonderful moderation made by the more than Ian and Sophie Dada made the program very interactive and alive. In fact, the today's exercise is conducted by our expert Anisofi and Dada, where some somewhere complimentary sessions like the physical meeting. Actually, I realized it was a very live and we had the opportunity to exercise like in the physical meeting. So finally, without taking further ado, I would like to express our sincere thanks to our valued participants who made these events possible by dedicating their valuable time Many thanks to the today's sessions that remain a little bit longer than the desired. However, we expect it remain very unique and also interesting than the other virtual sessions. I think our colleagues, we all are continuously participating in this program. This also signifies that the whole day session, even though it was a little bit longer, but it remained very useful and interesting and the participation remained continuous. So to conclude, I would like to emphasize the fact that the farmers are the ultimate beneficiaries of our work and we have to work closely with them by empowering them with effective solution. And we have very good take home messages and the farmers field is cool to curb the damage of this new science based and with this, I thank you all for making this event a great success. And thank you all. Thank you very much. Over to you, Marut. Uh, thank you, Yubak, for a very important closing remarks. And I would like to also thank FAO for providing uh, both technical support and uh, funding support for these uh, events. As I have mentioned earlier that uh, this workshop was supposed to be a hands-on field-based training and we had to turn it into the webinar uh, sessions, which uh, we also on this part has to learn these new technologies and will eventually uh, become an expert soon in the future. Uh, with that, I would again like to thank everyone that participated in this program. Uh, we had up to 71 participants at one point. And every day, every day of this session, of the three sessions, most participants stay until the end, even though it's a very, very long uh, three-hour session or more. So a grateful thank you to all the participants, the panelists, and the uh, technical team in the studio here. Uh, we hope to maybe see you in the future again. And with that, I think it's important for you to give us your feedback so that this information will help us maybe uh, continue this networking and sharing of this uh, wonderful uh, information that needs to spread out throughout the world. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Swadikap. Everyone can say Bye -bye. your microphone and talk to everybody if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. 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 Thank